Welcome to our series, Fine Poetry, Poems That Touch Deeper Chords. Today, Stephen Spender. Parani writes in the chapter, Trends in Modern English Poetry, from his brilliant book, Sri Aurobindo Savitri, An Approach and a Study. Quote, Stephen Spender also gives us remarkable touches of this inward subjective turn and of his perception of the worlds that are subliminal. Dissatisfied with the present European civilization and condemning it to a well-deserved end, he rises to the vision of the collective soul in a world remade. If some would say it is communism, it should be added that it is the perception of the inner spiritual reality which is the heart of communism. It is the poet's throbbing identity with the soul of man, the most downtrodden man that finds expression here. Says he, into the image of a heart that feeds separate functions with blood they need for what they make, will shape the wealth of the dispossessed world and let those riches pour their fertilizing river delta across the starved sand of the peoples. Purani again. The image of the wealth of the peoples as a heart feeding and nourishing all the different functions of the body social and enriching the dry, starved and unproductive sands, the peoples and turning the sands into a fertilizing delta is a proper acme to the poet's inspiration which invokes the peoples in the following words. Rise, will of life, in brothers. Purani continues, the physical body serves as a very apt symbol of the body social. In contradiction to the theory of class war as the solution of social problems, this symbol brings out the organic nature and interdependence of various social units, like the limbs of the human body. Rather than conflict, it suggests mutual adjustment and cooperation based on a sense of living unity. Is another poem, A Trance, contains an image of human love. From mutual unity attained by the lovers, sometimes apart in sleep, by chance, she falls out of my care alone into the chaos of a trance. The person that moves in the trance goes through suffering and sorrow, which is reflected dimly on the physical features of the sleeping partner. Suddenly there is a communication to this world from the world of trance, and in her unconsciousness she asks, who blesses? Or, Am I pursued by time 
she moans. And the lover who hears these words, thundering at his heart like stones, says, I watch that precipice of fear. She treads among her naked distresses. Purani. He is perhaps sorry that he cannot participate in the suffering and all the other experiences of her distress, which, however strong their unity of love in life, she must bear alone in that inner world. Probably the poet realizes the difference between the several personalities of his beloved and arrives at a deeper knowledge of the complex and mysterious personality of man. To that deep care we are committed beneath the forests of our flesh and shuddering scenery of these dreams where unmasked agony is permitted and bones are bared of flesh that seems our hands unraveling beauty's mesh meet our real selves, our charms outwitted. Purani again. The forests of the flesh and the shuddering scenery of dreams permits some part of our being to suffer unmasked agony. And when the thick curtain of the physical being is removed, one stands face to face with his inner personalities, real selves, which have lost all the charm which the external being had got. Man contains, like Jekyll and Hyde, even contradictory personalities within himself. And the author hints at their integration by a power of love. That is not important. What is important is the coming out of the subliminal worlds into the world of poetry with living concrete and vivid experience which opens out a new realm of the subliminal and the occult to the present day poetry. The trance. Sometimes apart in sleep by chance you fall out of my arms alone into the chaos of your separate trance. My eyes gaze through your forehead, through the bone, and see where in your sleep distress has torn its path, which on your lips is shown and on your hands and in your dream forlorn. Restless, you turn to me and press those timid words against my ear, which thunder at my heart like stones. Mercy, you plead, then who can bless, you ask. I am pursued by time, you moan. I watch that precipice of fear you tread, naked in naked distress. To that deep care we are committed, beneath the wildness of our flesh and shuddering horror of our dream, where unmasked agony is permitted. Our bodies, 
stripped of clothes that seem and our souls stripped of beauty's mesh meet their true selves their charms outwitted this pure trance is the oracle that speaks no language but the heart our angel with our devil meets in the atrocious dark nor do they part but each forgives and greets and their mutual terrors heal within our married miracle. On the third day, on the first summer day, I lay in the valley. Above rocks, the sky sealed my eyes with a leaf. The grass licked my skin. The flowers bound my nostrils with scented cotton threads. The soil invited my hands and feet to grow down and have roots. Bees and grasshoppers drummed over crepitations of thirst rising from dry stones. And the ants rearranged my ceaseless thoughts into different patterns, forever the same. Then the blue wind fell out of the air, and the sun hammered down till I became of wood, glistening brown, beginning to warp. On the second summer day, I climbed through the forest's huge tent pegged to the mountainside by roots. My direction was canceled by that great sum of trees. Here darkness lay under the leaves in a war against light, which occasionally penetrated splintering spears through several interstices and dropping white clanging shields on the soil. Silence was stitched through with thinnest pine needles, and bird songs were stifled behind a hot hedge. My feet became as heavy as logs. I drank up all the air of the forest. My mind changed to amber, transfixed with dead flies. On the third summer day, I sprang from the forest into the wonder of a white snow tide, alone with the sun's wild whispering wheel grinding seeds of secret light on frozen fields every burden fell from me the forest from my back the valley dwindled to bewildering visions seen through torn shreds of the sailing clouds Above the snowfield, one rock against the sky, shaped out of pure silence, a naked tune, like a violin when the tune forsakes the instrument and the pure sound flies through the ear's gate, and a whole sky floods the pool of one mind. 